Okay. Um, I'm just going to go right into introducing Chase and Taylor. Um, some context for those who uh, don't know um, Up in the Air's Revolver Festival. Um, back in, <laughs> seems so long ago, yet so close. Um, <laughs> back in 2020, I think we all were in production for many festivals and shows and events. Um, specifically, Revolver is a emerging and mid-career performing arts festival produced by Up in Air Theater on, uh, that's here in Ansia territories of Coast Salish Nations, aka Vancouver. And as many arts festivals, it curates largely in-person live shows and experiences and uh, with little experience into the digital media stream. So um, as we all know, when March rolled around and COVID-19 uh, was very much a reality for all of us, um, when the lockdown started to happen, um, a lot of our productions, including Revolver Festival, went in a bit of a holding pattern. Um, normally the festival's in May, June. Um, there is deadline set with partners. I know many of the people from the culture here. <laughs> um, and it was a, a negotiation as things were transforming. And to a certain point where, like many of us, we just knew that it, there was, it was not a legitimate way for us to move forward with an in-person live festival just to safety and considering uh, you know, the, the health and safety of our artists and, and, and audiences. So, um, so that portion of the festival um, uh, was, this, uh, was decidedly canceled. Um, in which, uh, you know, we worked with our artists, make sure they were paid, uh, worked with uh, our production teams to make sure everyone was paid, but um, unfortunately we were not going forward. Um, however, there was an opportunity that the producing team saw and um, that why not curate a whole festival with new artists that reflected the now of what was happening. And how do you present truly a digital theater or digital performing arts type of works. And so um, it, we had two months to pull it off. And, um, and it was a great team effort because it was truly a collaboration between um, our technical director, Taylor Jansen, and our uh, producers of Up in the Air Theater and the curation team, myself, Kaylee Sanamursky, uh, and also everyone else became a curator at that point to make sure that in the process of design of this digital festival, that we could do it right. And so, um, so essentially we moved into this digital platform. So this is a good uh, uh, segue into Taylor's and Chase's presentation because they were the central producing team that allowed for that to happen. And there was many challenges and learnings to be had. <laughs> um, first, I would like to introduce uh, Taylor Jansen, uh, who is the technical director for uh, Up in Your Theater's Revolver Festival and also specifically Evolver Festival. Um, she has been the technical uh, director for Up in Your Theater's The Ray. That was the last production, uh, another digital production that has just happened recently and Evolver Festival 2020 and Revolver Festival from 2018 to 2020. Um, and in which she was also previously the assistant technical director between 2013 and 2017, also is a very talented lighting designer um, in her own right. <laughs> um, also introducing Chase Paget, who is a multifaceted actor, musician, and filmmaker. He studied music at the University of Central Florida while performing at Walt Disney World and Universal Studios in various equity roles. Also uh, uh, an amazing performer, especially with his one-man show, Six Guitars, that has successfully done um, tours across North America fringe festival circuits and has other shows such as Nashville Hurricane and Heart Attacks and Other Blessings. Um, Chase decided to do the jump from being an artist into the, also the technical side of performing arts in 2016, which led to filming other artists live show and then realized there was much a need even prior to the pandemic of this um, for performing artists into the digital media realm. So I would like to introduce, um, welcome both of you. And we're so excited to hear more about Evolver Festival. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
All right. I've got a little slideshow thing that I'm going to start booting up. But yeah, today is kind of just like us chatting about the things that went well, the things that went wrong, maybe probably the things that kind of went wrong uh, that we sorted and worked through as a part uh, of the education points, if you will. Yes, the educational points of the working on the Revolver Festival. I'm just going to put myself up here for now. Uh, and because you need to add a little flair to everything you do because it makes it more amusing, we've got the trials, the tale of the trials and tribulations of Revolver to Evolver. Because uh, if you can't have fun with your life, what is the point? <laughs> Uh, oh, here. For people who are maybe joining in a little bit later, I think most people are already here, but if you need it um, for closed caption service, here's all that kind of information for you. Do, do, do. And that's us. Okay. I'm going to put myself back up here. Uh, yeah, so the curation and kind of the transitional period, uh, if anything, I was brought in, well, when the decision was made that Revolver wasn't going to happen and that instead, since they had funding, Up in the Air decided they wanted to do the Evolver Festival um, <laughs> in a two month window with performances in June. Uh, I, I basically was already on board. So I had jumped in super fast and started doing as much research as I could and realized probably like two weeks into doing research that there was just too much stuff to cover by myself uh, in regards to all the new technical stuff because I haven't worked a whole bunch with like video and with like internet connections and like the different softwares to you know make stuff happen so I realized very quickly that I needed someone like Chase <laughs> so uh, we were very lucky that Pippa, Pippa uh, had worked with Chase before and suggested that they that we like see if he's available uh, and he was which was amazing because chase chase really was like the technical glue that <laughs> brought everything together for uh the evolver festival but yes i was part of the uh curation transition so in in a sense i was able to head off you know some of the pieces that were suggested that might have been um a little too large in scope for a two month window to pull off. Uh, so having having to get basically uh, having your TD a part of the curation process for these kinds of festivals where there's like a lot of different creative ideas that are new and exciting. Uh, I think it was very useful for um, up in the air to kind of like, I don't want to be a block, but sometimes it's a very much like a yes company. So uh, sometimes you have to be the no person in the yes company. I feel like that's an important thing to bring up, particularly in the sphere of technical dissemination, because you know, imagination and creativity sky's the limit when everyone's in the same room. But the moment you start putting performances through video and piping that out to the internet, there are very real constraints that dreams are not gonna fix. Yeah, especially in a pandemic. Like that's the other part that, you know, <laughs> oh yeah really made things interesting oh yeah right it flips my video so i'm just gonna go over here and motion this way so the next thing that i just wanted to briefly chat about was obviously so can and the fact that so can is was very overloaded when the pandemic started and artists decided they all wanted to put their stuff online and honestly i don't think there's a good um good answer really for so can at the moment uh mainly because um they were they got overloaded uh and they didn't have like there aren't any online platforms that are like made for licensing similar to like how theaters are uh and on that front um that was kind of like the beginning half of my research uh when i started doing the festival i spent like a lot of those two weeks trying to like figure out what exactly we'd have to do in regards to SOCAN to get some of our pieces done uh, because we had uh, a DJ. We also had like a dancing, a father dancing with his young child. Um, and we also had uh, the House of Rice. So we had a like a 
a drag lip sync performance uh, was talking in between. So we had like three different pieces that we definitely needed to have, you know, coverage on when we were going online. But through my research, like all of the platforms, if they like can't, they'll, they'll trigger the copyright, like it'll, it'll catch the copyright sound and then, and then it'll either like stop people from joining, it might mute you, uh, or, and there's, it'll give you the copyright strike, but there's no way to like let them know in advance. Like that does not exist currently. So you're in the situation where if you get copyright stricken, all, all you can do is like fight it afterwards, which <laughs> it doesn't really make a lot of sense for theater and hence why we don't really have a good uh, solution. And I don't think SoCan has a good solution for it yet because there aren't really platforms built for us yet. Which segues into the platforms <laughs> situation, which I just, just touched on, but um, especially with Evolver Festival, and I know Chase can talk to this a fair bit, it's uh, the fact that we got so many, since we were doing a live digital festival uh, that was open to, we weren't specifying that you had to be on a specific platform as a result, which might have been a bit of a detriment. <laughs> we received a whole bunch of different platforms, which uh, Chase and I had to kind of like navigate and learn. So we had things on Zoom, we had things on Twitch, we had things on YouTube, we had things mm -hmm. uh, that were like on the phone, we had things on Discord, um, we had things that were on Zoom and Google Sheets at the same time. So uh, we had to YouTube, put YouTube, Twitch at this all at the same time. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, yeah streamline. <laughs> Streamlining platforms is uh, at least in um, a festival that has two months to get up <laughs> for, for this first round that we did. Would have been like one of those key points that, it's that hindsight 2020 kind of thing. So when we look back, it's like, yeah, we probably should have limited our platforms uh, that people could have presented their work on, which, you know, might have been a good limitation for people to kind of like work within. Um, but yes, uh, and through working with all of these different platforms, uh, we found that, you know, you have to do a lot of workarounds to get things to happen the way that artists would like them to, uh, in the way that they envision it. And there's no, there hasn't been really a good platform. Uh, there, at least nobody's made a platform that's like, you know, uh, is registered with SoCan so that if you make uh, uh, an account, you then have like coverage for whatever it is you post online. And like, that would be the ideal situation where you could like, there's a place that has licensing, but it's like online. And it's a, it's a platform that I think needs to be made Mm -hmm. for theater and for live performance. Because... As an artist who's who's uh, used copywritten songs that I'm performing, I'm not playing the actual tracks. Uh, I've had a big barrier getting my work like Six Guitars to translate to video and stream because then you start dealing with real lawyers and mechanical rights. Like there's a whole, and synchronicity rights if you're doing a video for it. There's several different categories of rights for songs that you have to secure. And all of those categories were developed before the internet happened. So really the internet is evolving way faster than the legalities of how to even, not just acquire the song rights, but even negotiate them in the first place. There's so many different song publishing houses. It's kind of a rat's nest. Yeah, and we don't have a easy solution apart from hopefully somebody in the community decides that, you know, they'll take on the role of helping to build this platform and in the future. And then, you know, maybe maybe we can all jump on board and support that person in building a platform that, you know, talks to all of these different sources and um, does things like that, because I definitely don't have the knowledge to do that. Uh, I'd love to, but that's not my forte at the moment. I uh, think uh, using the music knowledge and stage experience that I've had in the past, I think the best solution in the near term is either use music that is 
explicitly rights free. If you Google rights free music and a genre, you will find stuff. I promise. Taylor and I did that a lot actually for Evolver. On top of that, though, I think this is an an opportunity to contact composers and arrangers to say, can we commission a real piece? It's going to be way cheaper for you to do that, depending on who you hire than it is to hire lawyers and try to get that special track that you need. Could you accomplish something that sounds like it and it and does the same emotional work without a rights issue by contacting someone and paying a flat fee? That's an option that I don't see a lot of people pursuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Nico just put in, in the chat uh, or in the chat that there are different sites as well that kind of like offer mm -hmm. uh, like artist IO or art, art list is it art list I think it was IO art list IO story blocks is another one there's there's several yeah. services like that for sure that have different like music that people can use online that also have like uh, singers and songwriters that put music up there for people to use which is pretty sweet and it's definitely like a good step in the next direction but we need we need that platform <laughs> um ah yes I also had some stuff about the schedule. The one, it's a very interesting thing, kind of like building uh, the schedule for this festival because it, it was on such a short timeline and it was changing so quickly. Here we go. Let me just share this with folks so you can see. Oh, oh I just had a flashback. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, this was version one, which was all quite nice and, you know, we like set ourselves up so we'd have like an hour and 15 minutes to uh, basically like check in with each group before we would um, before we would like start the like pre-show uh, and then the performance would start exactly at the 7:30 time so that was like our time window to like check in with folks to be like is your audio working is your video working like you know making sure that they've practiced their uh, like tops and tails of the piece and so this was like the imagined schedule obviously it's not what it ended up being because I went through I think five versions mm -hmm. um we also had a very late night show on the phone but the this was this was like the the fifth schedule that we ended up coming to so one of the interesting things that ended up happening was that uh, very close to the start of the festival that was when there was a lot of the Black Lives Matters protests happening. And uh, we had performances on the Friday. So we ended up contacting the artists. Uh, specifically, it was uh, the New Societies and Desiree. And we were like, you guys, like, there's Black Lives Matters protests happening. We don't want to be in conflict with, you know, something that people should be paying attention to and, you know, going to. Um, so we asked the artists, like, would you like to do another show if we can like shift you at a different point in the schedule? Um, and uh, new societies decided that they weren't going to do anything, that they were just gonna take the day off and use more of that rehearsal time, kind of like leading up to their show to like really finesse their work and only do one show. And Desiree ended up putting a secondary show on the Sunday. But so that everything kind of like evolved very close to the festival. So this fest, this uh, calendar was like very live and changing at every single point uh, of the day. And what were some of the other interesting things that happened? Oh, um, Selective Memory initially had a show in the first week. But as we got closer to the festival, they contacted us and said that they couldn't do their showtime that they had listed initially and it could only be and it was also clear that like they were having um difficulties with rehearsal and timeline related things and so we we played the shuffle game and we managed to fit them into the second half of the week so we ended up having two selective memory shows in Instead the second the, week yeah yeah uh, we'll go into the other technical elements that were contributing factors to that moving schedule element uh, a little later on. Yeah, but as you can see, there's a lot of things. I put a lot of notes of like random stuff in here just to like keep track of like, you know, picking up people's gear, dropping off gear, checking in with uh, 
uh, shows. Like, there's a fair bit of information. It's a little chaotic, but that's kind of how the festival <laughs> was. So um, and then there was also the rehearsal schedule. So this is like the last, kind of like the week and a half leading up to the festival of like who's doing what and we kind of needed to plot it out so that we could figure out who was using what zoom account when so that like we didn't have like two people trying to have a rehearsal at the same time on the same zoom account uh so we ended up having to like get two i think we all i think we might have had like three in circulation at one point so that like uh selective memory and new societies could use Zoom at the same time to like do their rehearsals and Desiree could use a different one in case they ran long or they switched their times. Um, and then the only one that physically happened in a space which we had to get done before we got into the festival, which I am very glad we did, uh, was the House of Rice. So House of Rice is the only thing that happened in the culture lab. Um, and Yes, that was good. That was good planning to like really push the House of Rice to like get all their paperwork done so that we could tech, uh, tech them on the 12th, 13th and like 14th to like get everything ready, even though their performance was like the last show of the festival. Um, it was a great way to end the festival, though. It really was. Um, but yes, it was definitely one of those moments where it's like we would not have been able to tech them like during the festival time period uh, just because there was so much ferrying around of gear and equipment and that was version one and I think I went through three versions of the rehearsal schedule so this is kind of what the rehearsal schedule looked like at the end uh, so there was like a fair bit of you know more things were added uh, these were also like time periods where we'd try and jump in and like watch some of their rehearsal or watch like a tech run um, which is another thing I would suggest. I would suggest that if you have the time, we didn't necessarily have the time. So groups were still doing like rehearsals right up until the start of the festival. Some were doing them past the start of the festival. Um, my suggestion, if you're doing a digital festival, make sure everybody gets like a tech for like a tech run in that you get to see before the start of your festival. We'll get into further reasons why that is, but that's my suggestion for future folks doing digital festivals because yeah we tried but we didn't get through all, everything without any glitches so well, what's yeah, up next so taylor and let me just change my screen share back on over to the slides which we're using in beta mode by the way because <laughs> i found it yesterday i was like oh fun if there's one thing also all those digital experiences taught me is that if you see it, the word beta for a thing that you think is going to work, make sure you have a backup. Yeah. Moving schedule. Yeah, so we've got through that kind of stuff. Ah, yes. Home to the stage, changing your living room to a, into a stage. That was another big, <laughs> big learning part uh, of doing this festival. I think the big um, bottleneck here is that when you're trying to change your living room into a stage, particularly during a pandemic, you really have to rely on the individual technical expertise of the person who's going to be actually running it in the room. And with actors being actors, and I say this as an actor, the familiarity of tech stuff varies wildly, as you can imagine. Uh, and that's why at times, at least I was, and, and sometimes Taylor, uh, trying to impart on people, hey, I know you've got sky high dreams right now and your idea is very cool. You will not have the resources to do this by yourself in the room. And having that, you know, not to be a dream killer, but be a dream temperer is where this really starts for me really coming into reality. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, it was a big, like, this is, this is a picture of uh, the bartending school. Uh, so Dave, Dave Mott owns the bartending school. So a couple of the people from New Societies weren't able to do it in their house. So we needed to like find them an area where we could separate them, but still have a setup. So I like went there and tried a whole bunch of different setups with like, you know, ethernet cables and 
So this was one of the like examples, which I think showcases it fairly well. It's like in a corridor, <laughs> you've got like your laptop and a chair and you know, you've got some lighting sources to like make yourself look a little bit better on screen. And yeah, changing, changing your living room into a stage, that's, that's kind of like a real tricky part, especially because new societies had multiple um, cast members. So we had to get a whole bunch of like ethernet cable and a whole bunch of like ethernet adapters for everybody so that they could like plug in and get themselves situated um, with like a stable connection. Uh, and yeah, changing to like changing any kind of location into a stage is it's very, it's very peculiar kind of situation, especially since you're doing it to a camera and the camera doesn't see like it's generally in a fixed position, especially as Chase was saying with like the, if you can't troubleshoot it, you probably shouldn't maybe do it. <laughs> Frankly, because, yeah. yeah. If you can't, the, the shows for, in my experience, that went really well are the ones that people already kind of grasped if the technical demands were outside of their purview, their already previously established realm, they would then already start problem shooting, troubleshooting stuff ahead of time. And sometimes that even involved uh, contracting other people outside of Up in the Air to help work with just their show in particular. Because what we were able to do, though valuable, was very spread out amongst everybody. And uh, the ones that I think were ambitious and for the most part successful were the ones that either knew their stuff top to bottom already just by happenstance and experience, or they got someone who did to just focus on their thing. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, kind of delving into the people who really knew their like stuff, uh, as well as some of the tales of woes <laughs> that we have in regarding the festival. Uh, A Light Touch, which is the mind of the snail, uh, they did like a really great job. They had like an entire setup, one big multi-camera in their living room. They'd invite people in and they'd like basically project. Multi-layered projections. Yeah, yeah it, it was awesome. They'd project their face on a screen and then they'd like play with it in the overhead projector and like turn them into a fish. And like, it was amazing to like watch as well as experience. But one of the like bottlenecks we ended up facing with them is that, um, as it says, landlords and internet, uh, they didn't have direct uh, access to their internet connection. So they weren't able to run a hard line for their first show. Um, mainly this is because uh, with landlords, their landlords didn't speak English. So any communication had to go through the landlord's children to be able to like communicate what it was they needed. Um, and there's also the factor of like, if we ask for this, is it going to make our relationship worse? Like, is it going to put a bit of a like nail uh, in this relationship that I have with a landlord who is supplying like my living space? So that was kind of like where they had a lot of anxiety around like asking for this favor, um, which as a result, that first show that we did, it was like really great, but at a certain point, like, they had upgraded their Wi-Fi, but the connection speed still wasn't enough to keep up with their show. And it ended up becoming rather pixelated near the end. And we ended up doing a lot of troubleshooting on it. And we did come to the conclusion that yes, it's because you're not directly connected into the internet with a hard line. Um, so on that dark on that dark day Monday, <laughs> this girl went and bought more ethernet cable. Which is pretty cheap and can run a hundred meters. It's very worth it. Very, yeah. very worth it. Yeah. And they managed to talk to their landlords and the kids and they were totally understanding and super on board. So thankfully that anxiety didn't play out into any kind of like repercussion for them uh, in their living space. And it ended up working really well. And the second show that happened was amazing. But like that was a big kind of like meh moment. Um, for them in the festival. And we also have two other shows. These are two of our, um, our national shows. So uh, both of them, I believe, were in Ontario. 
So Yard Dances for Joy and Healing and Ish Kle Ayi. Um, so these two shows both did something very well, which we touched on before, which is they had a uh, technical support with them for their specific show, which was extremely useful considering they were also national shows and uh, time, time range and things like that um, was difficult otherwise to necessarily get a hold of them or like drop in on rehearsals, especially since Yard Dances for Joy and Healing was um, also a little bit based around the timeline for a small child <laughs> and his dad dancing together. So, you know, children, rehearsal time is kind of very fluid. <laughs> so there wasn't necessarily a specific time we could hop on uh, as easily as other performances. Um, but Chase, you want to chat a little bit about kind of like the technical aspect that we had to do with them and like combining the Zoom and QLab together? Yeah, 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 yeah. So Yard Dances with uh, for Joy and Healing, their contacted third party technical point person was Peter Carlone, who's an extremely funny improviser, comedic person, as well as sort of general media maven in Vancouver. Uh, love Peter, known him for years, super great dude. He did a great job providing remote control of the visual aspects that were overlaid to the performance. So initially this performance involved multiple cameras that were going to live stream and connect uh, into Zoom and also interface with an OBS that uh, Peter was controlling remotely to have overlays of PNG formats to allow like an animated pair of eyes with the actual eye, the whites of the eyes cut out so that that was the interface in which the patron at home could see the performance and then it would change and float and, and alter things. Uh, I'll be honest, when I was, when I first heard the concept, I thought of a couple of like, okay, let me troubleshoot this as much as possible here. And uh, one of the ones that I was worried about, of course, was weather, but I thought rain. And it turns out overheating was really the biggest issue on this one, where I think it was the cell phone. Correct me if I'm wrong, Taylor. Yeah, the cell phone. Yeah. So we were going to use the cell phone and hopefully a GoPro to be a multicam solution into the OBS and then to Zoom. And his cell phone kept overheating because it was just really hot outside. Uh, I think we found a good middle solution. And all in all, even with Gus, the little kid playing along, it ended up being a really rewarding experience. Um, but I do think it's an example of meeting challenges with a, a willingness, but an also an understanding that there are factors that you're not gonna foresee. Mm -hmm. I think we had to put like the phone in the fridge. I think that was what we well, did, yeah. Pre -show? We had to pre-chill the phone. Yeah. <laughs> before the performance, which was amusing. It was an amusing solution. Um, and then Ishkoi Ai had kind of like a two-part kind of situation to it. So our, our the mandate for the festival was like a live digital performance. Um, and so they had a couple like intercut, like pre-recorded videos that would like play between them doing like this really weird, like live puppetry. Uh, avant-garde kind of. Avant-garde really funky stuff um super super interesting and there was a cat in the videos it was a good time um but chase i think you found them a solution to basically like run qlab into zoom mm -hmm. because yes. zoom at the time was being like nah you don't get a virtual <laughs> camera option. yeah now that, oh my god zoom i mean we could bitch about zoom all day but there was a time where Zoom didn't allow you to use third-party virtual webcam pieces. So you couldn't just switch back and forth between a thing. And I think what I ended up doing, it went from QLab to Siphon to OBS. I think that's what it did, which is an, an, a workaround that you can interface QLab, our favorite software ever, into this kind of workflow. It's not always the right solution, there's another solution called ManyCam that I've just used for just in the last week that's uh, also very flexible and powerful. It just kind of depends on what you're looking to do. Um, but it is an example of really being fearless and reading the manual for whatever you're trying to do, spending time on YouTube, asking the YouTube gods, did anyone figure this out already? And 
sometimes almost never actually is someone like here's the solution usually it's like here's one third of the solution and then you have to figure out the second and then the final third of it uh and that's an example of getting qlab to interface with this one in particular yeah there was a lot of there was a lot of that research going on throughout the festival uh and then we have selective memory so <laughs> How do we really feel? I titled this one when things go wrong because this is, I guess you could say, the piece that was A, the most ambitious, B, had a new performer, um, uh, C, had very limited like rehearsal time, uh, D, really did not benefit from the pandemic and like, you know, the isolation kind of a thing. So there was like mm -hmm. so many factors that went into <laughs> why the first performance of the show was more of a dress run that ended up needing to be halted uh, because the communication basically broke down in the in the group and um, uh, we weren't able to get it back on track to keep going. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, in selective memory. Uh, to kind of get a sense of what the piece was, the piece was uh, a DJ who had a, uh, two different areas. One area where he was going to be doing live DJ work and a secondary area where he would kind of like sit down. Um, they would have like choosing of records and then there'd be a storytelling moment. And um, he had like the limitation where he had kids and he like worked during the day so he could only rehearse for a certain amount of time in the evening. Mm -hmm. And they had a second, they, they did have a technical like kind of lead, I guess you could say, who was doing uh, like the projection design slash switching the cameras. But the problem that they had was that their person for that was in Ontario and was like and a remote number of- sharing into the computer. That was my biggest, I yeah. mean like, that was my biggest red flag. Hold up, you're gonna fire these cues by remote control screen sharing into the person's computer in Vancouver. That sounds risky. And they were very confident, no, it's fine. We've done it before. It didn't work. Not the first time, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so the person was in Ontario, hence there's like a time delay, there's, you know, time zones and things like that. So, uh, they're, they can only rehearse in the evening, which means their person is like probably rehearsing with them like midnight to two in the morning uh, a lot of the time. And it was clear that like they couldn't keep that up. Uh, and the rehearsal period was like a lot of like working through things, um, but not so much the tech things is kind of how it ended up kind of playing out. So we were a little surprised when we went to what should have been the tech rehearsal and they were doing more of a cue to cue. Uh, so they were still like running through things and we had delivered uh, like a wireless microphone and some other things to them like at least a week in advance and found out that day that they hadn't set it up yet to try it. <laughs> that was one of those moments where you're like as a technical director, you're like, well, that's where what? we are. Okay. Yeah. We're here now. Yeah. So we did everything we could to like, you know, help facilitate that first show that they had. But um, uh, I think I think it was that their sound card crashed and the performer left their phone over by the computer and like their the the software that they were using to remote control in had to have confirmation every 30 minutes from the computer to like uh let you continue to use it so then their tech person couldn't continue using the computer but the performer didn't know that like either of these things had happened because he didn't have his phone with him to like follow up with it and so um Chane and myself who was doing I believe the dramaturgy for it and I was like in the chat being like ah hmm, this doesn't seem to be going very right at the moment uh yep. so we ended up it was also going super long and starting to like um overlap with the following uh show who also was using the same zoom account 
one of those things where you're like, ah, those should have been on separate Zoom accounts uh, when we made the link, but they were all on one. So we had to, at a certain point, call it and basically end the show. And uh, which was unfortunate, but like they really pulled it together the second day, like their second performance. They, they realized they took that moment of like failure and like really figured out what their problems were. Uh, that mainly being that like their communication broke down. Um, we were, we basically helped troubleshoot with them to be like, wait, you can just remote desktop in with like actual Apple instead of using this other program that requires confirmation. So we were able to like simplify yeah. the remote desktoping in and like the second show was like really great. It still ran longer than it was supposed to, but like in comparison, like they were so much more prepared and, um, the second show went really well. So it's just unfortunate that, you know, well, the first one was a good learning experience for everybody, but. <laughs> but the goal is to have tech failures to learn without an audience. Yeah, so. It's Can't charm good... your way through bad sound. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of those um, kind of like, goes back to the, if you can't tech troubleshoot it yourself, like in the space, maybe you should reconsider what you're trying to do online. Oh yeah. So yeah, those were kind of like our, that was, I think our biggest uh, things gone wrong uh, during the festival. So <laughs> post festival, after we did the festival with the live mandate, we kind of, and after doing pro like the array and doing that one, a pre-recorded version I think it's pretty safe to say that we all um decided that uh we did just get a question from Phil actually did you refund tickets when these failures or uh, uh the festival, or actually uh the festival was free so there's no amount to refund it was all by donation and we asked that like anybody who uh was part of it that um wanted to see the show uh to try and catch the second time that was happening, I think on the Saturday. So yeah, we were basically mm -hmm. like, hey guys, this is not going so good. Please try and catch the Saturday show. Like, um, yeah, but it's all free slash by donation. So there were no tickets to refund on that part, which was fortunate for us because it was an entirely free festival. Um, but yeah, pre-recorded versus live. I think we came to, Chase and I have come to the conclusion that we would prefer to do uh, pre-recorded, then live stream, then doing straight live stream, unless it's like absolutely necessary or like time restrictions make it so that you don't have time to edit mm -hmm. the show. Uh, with that, I feel like a lot of the artists and producers that I've encountered uh, less so in the last few months, but definitely at the start of COVID when they started entertaining these ideas, were adamant to maintain that feel of live theater, uh, that it's that you're in the room with the event. And cool, but I think it's very important to have an accurate understanding of what that means. Because I, as a video person, can go into a space, do a three camera shoot, multi-cam or uh, edit the next day, plus multi-track mix of all the lobs, all the sound design, the room mics, I can do all of that in a pretty fast turnaround. And it's going to look and sound pretty great. But if you do that, same amount of workflow as a live stream in real time, well, now one person can't do all of that. It has to be minimum three, probably to five uh, and maybe even more. So, and the chances that you're gonna nail every single part of it with the time and resources you have, depends on your time and resources, but honestly, you're just gonna get a better experience. I mean, the bit rate of streaming alone will limit the audio and particularly video fidelity that the end user is going to use. So if you can just film it and then stream that thing, you're going to have a better experience. The only thing I, as a performer and improviser by trade, think, okay, I understand you need to make this live, is if there's something about the experience that requires audience input in real time. Hi, I need a suggestion for a non-geographical location, whatever. If you're doing an improv show, any of that stuff. Or there's some element to the chat that you need to bring into the feed for some reason. If that's your concept, I totally get it. Otherwise, film, edit, upload, move on. Yeah, 
another way you can look at it is that if you want to do it live, uh, you need to have you know, people with a lot of knowledge to be able to troubleshoot anything that's happening uh, like at the time that it happens. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you could be hooped. So collective memory, you know, they weren't able to troubleshoot that in the moment by themselves. That's a really great example of like where that kind of like would have benefited from probably having some pre-recorded stuff in it to help kind of interplay. Mm -hmm. I think, Chase, this is kind of like one of your quotes. Yeah, <laughs> so one of the things that we found uh, putting this thing together was that a lot of our time and energy went to just delivering the basic tech necessities to make everyone's dispersed setups a reality, even functional. And it really felt like, I think I'd called it, yeah, uh, Uber Eats except with cameras. Like we were just delivering cameras and GoPros and dongles, so many dongles, um, that it really felt like a lot of our troubleshooting was maybe oh, we figured this out in five minutes, but now it takes 30 minutes of drive time to, to deal with directly. We got a question here. Do you think having a technician dedicated to each show like a venue technician would have been able to support selective memory uh, if you were to do it in the future? Uh, I think it would have helped, but because of the pandemic, they were also very very anxious about having anybody over to help them with anything. So mm -hmm. um, during that time period, no. Uh, in future time periods, maybe, but that's also going to depend on like, if we're still in a pandemic. Um, if we're not in a pandemic, then absolutely. <laughs> Super valid. No one is allowed in my house. Ditto. I think this is kind of one that we've um, talked about before, but just, you know, accepting that your skill level is more of an invitation for inspiration than, a, than necessarily seeing it as like a limitation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a, as a person on stage and behind the camera as of late, it's a thing I've come to realize is very true. Um, in the video world, you'll find particularly young filmmakers get really hung up on gear and rightly so. Like those are valid tools to achieve a, a dream, achieve a vision. But you should never let a lack of gear or funds or resources get in the way of what you're trying to achieve. And in fact, it can even inform what you're doing. Uh, as an improviser, a lot of the improv scenes that I've ever done were really just simple guardrails to a scene that you could honor and then explore and then at times even break. And I think that was really fun. Another example that comes to mind is, all right, we're just using these webcams or whatever. Uh, I, I helped uh, facilitate the tech of an improv show at the start of COVID. And one of the scenes was normally in an improv setting, uh, one of the improvisers is on stage interacting with a character and the other character is voiced by another improviser off stage because that character physically is so minuscule you cannot see them on the space but with a camera multicam setting well now that's just someone's phone on the ground so now you're actually like holding them up and directly talking to the viewpoint of the invisible character that's so small things like that i think really um require a moment of how do we rethink this and come back to a fresh take on it with the limitations we have. But they really can be interesting. And to come back to Mind of a Snail, I think they're doing an incredible example of, of that. They know their tech back and forth and they're using that knowledge to bring people into a space virtually and then deliver that experience to other people who are not there, either virtually or re reality, yes. The other thing that I'll just jump on in regards to their characters is their characters were played as scientists, so they could troubleshoot as their character, which was another kind of like big bonus that they had in regards to the piece that they created. Um, so 
as a part of the show, they could troubleshoot things that were going wrong, which is kind of great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And if you do end up doing a character that's not tech savvy, oh, look, you've just justified any problem that comes up. And now it seems yeah. like it might be a creative choice. <laughs> and people will never know. <laughs> nope, we'll but, never figure it out. Yeah, there's like so many stories that we have from this uh, festival and like, you know, deciding to do an entire digital festival for the first time. Um, but we can't obviously get to everything. But I think, Chase, you wanted to just touch on, I think this is maybe our last little point before we get on. Yeah. To, uh, uh, I am a, not an equity performer. It's just because it's I've never been in a position where it served me as someone who primarily makes a living, made a living, uh, doing their own work on stage. It would, it would just kind of get in the way of things. Uh, but I understand its value completely. I will say it's been a little frustrating at times, and maybe in the last month or two things have evolved, but it's been frustrating to try to get uh, equity or uh, sag aftra to just say, do whatever you want, just figure it out. We don't want to get in the way of your thing. You know, I, I produced a digital festival based on just shows that I had filmed and edited and stuff the year before in Fringes, not knowing this was going to happen. And all the shows that I presented in this package sold on Vimeo. It went really well. And I got to give, you know, a bunch of artists, 10-ish, uh, you know, several hundred dollars of revenue over time. And one of them had to drop out because they said yes. And then they said, wait, let me get back to you. And then they said, equity can't allow it because what we're doing is against equity rules. So I would say moving forward, if you are a member of equity or you're involved with that leadership in any way, do whatever you can to carve out a slice of this world, this new digital world, particularly for that, because it costs those actors a couple to several hundred dollars. And uh, I think in the long run, costs actors and self-created professionals more than just money. It also create, it lowers your profile because people can't see your stuff and if it isn't filmed, it's only in memory. Yeah, I think that's all that we kind of like wanted to for sure chat about at the moment before we like broke out into the breakout questions and um, or the breakout rooms and the chat and questions. Uh, so I think I'm gonna hand it back to Emily and Davey for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, ASL applause. <laughs> um, you're up. Um, so um, because this was such a f um, an amazing presentation and um, we just feel like with the rest of the time that's left, we aren't going to go into breakout rooms anymore. Uh, just because I just think that um, um, that we'll start with a main question uh, from uh, Emily and I, and then if anyone would like to um, to ask a question about what was talked about, uh, based off of our main questions coming up or what happened in the presentation, please again let us know in the chat. Um, There's one right now. Yes, awesome. And then so how the process goes is that let us know in the chat. I'll call your name up if you want to verbally say it yourself. Uh, just please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Um, and if you don't, just let me know in chat. I'll read it out for you. Um, just to be aware, we're not going to stop recording this. So um, just let us know in the chat how you feel about that as well. Uh, this will be made public on our GBBTA YouTube. So I just wanted to uh, state that. So thank you so much, everyone, for your patience uh, with that adaptation. Um, em, I throw it to you the main question to start this Q&A portion off. Um, who would I be if I didn't make a joke first? Uh, one of you mentioned hindsight is 2020. I'm now really upset I didn't name this hindsight is 2020 because all the lessons we learned were last year. Moving on from the joke. Um, originally, I was going to ask about um, the unique theater offering, but you kind of already touched on that. So I'm going to start with how do you guys, both of you folks, feel about the jump from theater into a digital space? And then I have a follow-up question about our futures. 
Uh, yeah, uh, if I, I'll tackle yeah, that right out of the gate. Sure. I've actually been a big advocate for making theater translate to film for several years, even mm -hmm. before the pandemic. I was involved with a theater down in Portland, Oregon that got a big grant and turned their theater into okay. a live sound space or sound stage. Uh, okay. And that's where this sort of education for me started. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little different depending on if you're doing stage work for sort of canonized theater or stuff that is written by one party and then contracted into a season and then we're casting those players. That's one thing. The other end is more of a fringe theater model where it's like small run and gun can still be really good, but usually the writer and the performer are the same person with maybe a director. <laughs> I think the digital sphere, honestly, is best suited currently to serve the more fringe type folks, the fringe performer model, rather than the more main stage stuff that uh, theater companies aspire to. Because you're gonna run into way less issues in terms of rights or distribution. You're not gonna need to consult with many people in terms of, uh, hey, how can I just sell this online? Like a bunch of my fringe friends have shows that they can just sell online. Now, the quality of the production value is a different uh, conversation and that I really wanna up that kind of across the board, but they don't have to talk to a playwright. They don't have to talk to the theater that first presented that work. They're, and usually they, sometimes they don't even have to talk about like rights for music issues if they're doing original music. In short, if you're a, a real savvy and nimble and self-driven creative force in multiple avenues, there's just way less barriers for you. Mm -hmm. There's just way less. And moving forward, I think having a digital option is going to be more and more and more attractive. Uh, I think it's almost going to start becoming a necessity particularly if you're the, the small time nimble fringe folk, because if you want to get booked in a performing arts center, and I know yeah. this from personal experience, you need good video. No one's going to take you seriously if you don't have good video. They yeah. just won't. They really won't. Um, and, but moving forward with other things that are like, okay, we're going to contract you, uh, commission a play from you. Mm -hmm. We're also going to make that commission conversation involve streaming rights to some degree, because... Okay. I think it also, if you can really nail that down, it completely changes the economic model. Theaters that are 300 seats or less, it's tough to do stuff in there that's like real fancy and to mm -hmm. make that in the black financially. However, if you remove the fact that you have a limited capacity by putting it on the internet and people are raving about it, well, guess what? Now your limited capacity is the English speaking world. It's a massive paradigm shift. And suddenly small theater companies that are savvy and no digital production can be explosively more um, powerful and have more impact across the globe, not just in their town. Are you saying that, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be inter interpreting it mm -hmm. in such that fringe shows instead of live entirely should only be filmed or would I think they, they have an easier filmed? time. I, I think everyone film? should film. Okay. Ev everybody should film. Uh, I think they have an easier time uh, for multiple reasons. Large casts, anything like over like three or four people becomes much more tricky to film in a reduced camera number. In my opinion and my experience, uh, one camera lockdown archivals, don't even share them only keep them for your own self purposes to yeah. be like, I did this someday on your deathbed. And then, or earlier. Uh, and then if you want to actually show other people, make it three cameras, really make it three cameras. You could make it two, but the amount of work that you, ha you have between two and three cameras is really not that much more, but you're getting a 50% boost in, in options for editing, which is huge. Um, I would also like to say this in terms of audio. Mm -hmm. Audio is more important than your camera. It's just way more important. Yeah. I don't care. It, like if I can see you and make it out, cool, great. 
your eyes are way more forgiving than your ears are. They just are. So before, I would even say before you start learning editing or getting in any of that, learn mixing. Get the right tools to mic your actors with lobs. There's some stuff out there that's actually not that expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the fewer performers you have on stage, the easier that's gonna be to make that a reality. And that's why I say the fringe folk are, mm -hmm. are at a unique advantage for the first time ever. My question though, oh, after I'll go with Stevie in a minute because um, I'm also curious like what that feels to me because I'm just thinking of all the times I've enjoyed a fringe festival and just mm -hmm. been like, you know, you hit up five different shows. There's one show you're crying at, one show you're laughing at, one show you grip your friend and you're like, I can't fucking believe it. Um, do you not lose that sort of like cohesive, emotional group, kinesthetic response sort of? It will atmosphere. be dampened. It will be dampened, yeah. but I would argue this. When you watch Hannah Gadsby's Nanette, or mm -hmm. if you watch the new one that's on Hulu right now, in and of itself, mm -hmm. those are primarily not comedy specials. You could argue that Nanette is a hybrid of such, and I would agree with it. I laughed all the time. She's it. a performer, she's a performer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, but what you're also experiencing is another level of theatrical presentation in those experiences. Am I in the room for them? No. Am I impacted by them? Yes. So that's why, it's not the same, it is dampened. But mm -hmm. I would also argue that putting stuff on film shows you all of the flaws. It's a real reality check because if you're in the room and you can be, you're gonna forgive people for taking a little bit longer to articulate a thing in a script than you would sitting at your home looking at a laptop screen. So yeah, it's not the same, but if you wanna, achieve the highest heights of what you want to do as a self-made creative person, it's a thing you're going to have to embrace. And I think patrons will reward you for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Davey here. Um, this is a bit, of, uh, this is a question from Ingrid Turk in the chat, but I'm also going to wrap it up a little bit more. Um, and for you, Taylor, see if you can answer this. And also uh, Chase and Emily and anyone else in the chat, please contribute. Um, specifically, Ingrid's wondering, are there examples of explosively successful small scale theaters who've mastered digital presentation? And I actually would follow that question up uh, because a lot that have already been talked about is a very independent theater kind of context is. It's like theater made from people's homes, pre-recorded fringe. Um, I would also ask that what what are formats you've seen as well that have worked pretty, pretty um, successfully that, you know, yeah, sure, to pre-record a lot of things, but it, it goes back to our, our other central question of like, what makes theater anymore? Because that just makes, in a way, in my perspective, it becomes still digital, just digital media. So mm -hmm. like, what, what is the core that still makes a theater? And um, I, I want to hear Taylor and you folks first before I contribute uh, a company I work with, Players Theater Center, which we had uh, things called inscripted events. And I feel like it, it kind of goes into the ethos of, of what is the actual adaptations that are making it still theater, but it's on a digital platform. So actually, Taylor, do you, do you have any great examples do you know of? Um, I think uh, probably our best example, at least ones that I've worked on, would probably be the array. I think the array had the most kind of like filmed, but still felt like theater. Um, for those who got to see it, uh, the array had um, four different uh, performing groups. It had Rice and Beans Theater, it had House of Rice, it had uh, Hunters, Mister, uh, Hunters, Mystics, and Tricksters. Hunters, Tricksters, and Mystics, wrong way around. Uh, and what was our last group? Uh, the, the letter show? The... Oh yeah, Popcorn Galaxy. Yeah. 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 Uh, dead, <laughs> uh, uh, dead, dead Letter Society. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the Dead Letter Society. Um, yeah, it had all of those ones in, and I think, especially with like uh, the House of Rice, as well as um, uh, the Rice and Beans show, I felt like those two still. 
captured kind of that feel of like you're there watching a theater show um like you're in you're in the room kind of a thing like we weren't trying to be too perfect we also had a very short timeline on that one so like you know there's parts where like you'll see us like moving around the space kind of like throwing the ball back in while Derek and Pedro play the soccer game while there's like text over top um so I, I think yeah it's that tricky part of like theater versus film and if you film it like how many, how much are people going to be like, oh, look at all these flaws versus live where you're like, it's okay for there to be flaws and how to kind of navigate that between the two. So that like theater, mm -hmm. I guess, like you still expect maybe some of those flaws even in the digital like recorded version of it. Yeah. That makes any sense? No, I, sure. I feel like yeah. that's kind of like, flaws that aren't like so glaringly uh like you don't want flaws that like draw your attention so closely to them that you're like oh my god this is clearly a flaw um if you're doing a digital or recorded version of it but i feel like that's kind of what gives you that live feeling so yeah. it's like balancing that amount of like you can tell that like you're like oh yeah i could see a little bit of a tech table in the background or like something like that, that's not too much of an issue. Uh, sorry, Chase and M, is that okay? Because yeah, Chase, sure, Chase. yeah. Uh, I would say, have I thought, it, have I encountered an example of an explosively successful small theater group? Explosively? Depends on your definition. My definition would be generating enough revenue to exist comfortably to achieve your artistic goals without any arts funding, to be self-perpetual in the black with just revenue from online sales or in-person sales. Essentially, are you a successful for-profit arts venture? Which is stupid to sound like, but I came from America and that's kind of the only way it works. Uh, Cause it's real different down South in terms of grants y'all. It's one tenth per capita. So uh, no. No, I don't think that example exists. I think the first, there's three parts of that equation. Are people making work that could translate? I think that's 100% correct. Yeah, people are doing that. The middle, does the technology exist to capture it and do justice to it on a scale that is potentially cost effective? Yes, particularly in the last few years, there's been a lot of revolutions in camera quality uh, that have brought what looks like almost Netflix grade video quality to a near every person access in terms of cost. I'm not talking like you can film it with $500 and a sling cam. I'm talking like, you know, an A7S three, which just came out. That's like three and a half grand. You add another lens to it. That's another five memory cards, whatever. But that's an order of magnitude less than what Netflix does on a production by a lot. So it becomes very different, particularly if you install it in a venue and you've got regular repeat stuff. Now you've got an infrastructure. You're just turning stuff on that's already installed. Very different cost reality. The big barrier, I think, is the last third. It's the actual delivery of the content to the people. And Taylor and I were talking about this earlier. There just isn't a platform for it yet. There just isn't. There needs to be a combination of YouTube, Zoom, and Patreon in a single platform that allows patrons to form an ongoing relationship, not to just an artist, but the actual organization that produces their content on a regular basis. And it promises those patrons regular independent arts exposure that is high quality, that is watchable, that is interesting. And somebody has to be kind of the face of that organization for years in a row. Like, uh, I'm doing uh, some filmings and stuff and an artistic director is like, hi, I'm blah, 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 blah. And I'm here to introduce you to this show. That person has to be a key critical component to that thing. Then on top of that, all of that has to be in a platform that schedules streams, that schedules different passwords for those streams, that allows you to upload sizzle reels, or maybe even allows you to watch the first five minutes for free, and then asks, would you like to continue watching? Then please subscribe to our Patreon. And then 
within those levels, just like Patreon and just like subscribers to other arts platforms that are brick and mortar, you, you get what you put in, you know, there's mm -hmm. so much opportunity. It's just that last mile problem of how, what's the most elegant way we get it to the patron. That one's tough. I have ideas clearly, but it doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I, I'm going to offer a little bit of a counter because I just feel like, okay. yes, that's very much so. If you, if that is your intention is to be very self-sufficient in which you're creating constant content constantly for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a great way to go. But I feel like as well, and I think maybe this is the difference between Canadian and, and an American or other, I, I don't know. I, I don't know any other theatrical contexts that are working out right now. Um, I think is 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 also considering the fact that what is your intention of the people that you're drawing to the to the screen? What what is your engagement with them? Like for example, is it through chat engagement? Is it through some type of asynchronous materials that go out? Um, I, I don't want to go to it too much, but I feel like there there is a question about intention, and I think. Um, what I'm trying to, uh, I would like to swerve it back towards is, um, is the idea of like what, for folks that are like, a lot of the people that are part of this right now are technicians and, and producers and, um, and, um, and, and uh, uh, designers. And I think one of the things is like, they work with artists to make visions collaboratively happen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering from a sense of like features, like what, what do, or what are people feeling right now? Is this a case that we're coming, going to come at, is it, is this a case where people are going to have vaccines and they're like, you know what, this was a very nice temporary uh, stopgap. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to come back. Or is this a case where a lot of us are going to commit to these type of adaptations, right? And so I would like to hear, especially for folks uh, in the chat, like what are what are people's general sentiments of what the future is feeling like? Uh, Emily, do you want to respond a little bit to that? Uh, respond or further the question? Yeah, just just respond. I think uh, it would be nice to to hear people's oh. perspectives from that. I don't know. It's it's hard because I feel in many ways everyone has spoken towards what I sort of expect. Like there will be an increase in video quality. Artists have increasingly been asked to step ahead into more technical roles, which in some ways is nice for us because then um, there might be a little bit less translation for us to have to do when we work with performers or directors when we have to talk about dreams and technical capacity. And I'm like, that's a really cool idea. We're using a board designed in 1983. You're gonna get on, you're gonna get off. There's gonna be no chases. Like how do I kind of work through that? And then, I don't know. I'm, I'm actually really nervous about the idea of fully abandoning theater in the fringes and letting just like the arts club be the only ones you can go see in person because those aren't the shows I'm seeing. Those are not the shows I'm seeing. I'm going to Revolver, I'm going to Push, I'm going to any other festival besides the arts club. I'm so sorry if you're from the arts club and you're here, it's not you, don't take it personally. I don't have money. And so just the concept of us being back in and together because I think we were forced online. I don't think anybody woke up and was like, you know what, fuck this. I prefer not to be touched. And it's, I'm introverted, that's fair. But we were forced there, away from our communities, alienated. I can't read the room because there's no room to read. I'm trying to read this tiny screen. There's no side eyes. There's no, hey, um, can you tell the performer to hold? There is none of that. And so... I don't know, because I would I like to think the future is going to be more in person and probably a little more rowdy because we've spent a year away. But I also think it'll take us a really long time to remember what that feels like. 
And in the meantime, we're going to do a lot more remote stuff, a lot more like, oh, hey, I don't have to be in person for this. I don't, can I just video chat in? And I think there will be a lot more accessible options in those ways. We won't expect everyone to come in. Like if you're having a bad day or your schedule is so much that traveling is going to just ruin the day or maybe you're sick and you don't want to come in. Like we're going to give you those opportunities to still be in the room. But I'm not sure it's necessarily going to entirely change the output. I know dance dance video has changed a lot from what I've seen. I'm not saying just to be yeah. clear, I'm yeah. not saying that we should exclusively move theater to oh, no, online. No, no. Okay. And if you look at history, like when the Spanish flu got sort of passed over, yeah. it, like vaudeville exploded. People are gonna come right. back. I'm supposed to go do my one man show at Mervish in Toronto. Like that got canceled in March, right? So I'm very much looking forward to getting back to that reality. Mm -hmm. Don't I don't I, let me make sure I'm I'm clear about what okay, I'm, okay. what I'm getting I, across I here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like yeah, it was it, it yeah. I didn't I, I think I didn't interpret it the other way where it it did sound like we were losing my little friend Arenos that I got. Oh, I see. want that. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for that, you know, big time, for sure, it's, for sure. I think it's going to be to, it, you don't have to leave that world. You can expand that world is okay. I, I guess what I'm yeah, trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of where I'm with. Yeah, yeah. Taylor? Yeah, it's a weird, I did, um, uh, it was basically like solo dance performance, like showing mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Like it was streamed online with the happening dance and it was a very, it's, it's like a weird feeling, the fact that, um, mm -hmm. You're basically there and the performers are there and there's a and there's a camera and there's no audience to sit in the seat there's no like applause afterwards so you like as the technical person who's like you know doing the lights and like running the show you then feel that like after they go to take their bow you're like they're like clapping like super loud just to like give them a sense of like what the room would feel like yeah um and it's yeah they're like we also came to an agreement that you know if let's say there's some sort of weird technical glitch and the sound has an issue, I've got like a God mic that doesn't send over the video, but I can basically tell them, hey guys, we're gonna stop and we're gonna start again, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. We didn't have to do that, but we had that in place if we needed to. And it's such, it's such a weird feeling doing that kind of a thing in a room because it feels like you're doing it for no one. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a very weird feeling. So I definitely agree. Like super want to be able to do in-person things again but I can also see the value of having on top of that like yeah. digital performances one of the things uh, as through my connections with the cult is like something that's happening now is that as like a presenting house what what can happen is like a video can be filmed you know in Berlin and then we basically present that video as a live stream so we don't have to fly all of the performers out uh, and you know set up an entire show and have people come view it live it's possible to also have that potentially on top of like the live shows that we would host here in Vancouver which I thought was like really interesting the fact that like you can have like your normal season shows but you can also on top of that add digital events that you know like, hopefully quality wise increase over mm -hmm. the next while and like right. borders are no longer going to matter. Time zones won't matter as much. We're going to be a little bit more unified, would you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the hope. I think it's already happening. I think oh. people are adjusting time. Like, for example, uh, Paris <laughs> with us. Well, I mean, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I think things are shifting. Like, for example, um, uh, we had a, 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 an event called Inscripted at Players Theater Center, which we try to join live playwrights with their work with audiences and communities in an event. It's, it's less of a show, it's an event. And so we had some be recorded and some live discussions and oh, yeah. we interacted mm -hmm. in the chat. And so um, one of the biggest things from that is that we shifted our time to 5 p.m. because we realized there were people from the East Coast that wanted to tune in. And we also had a, uh, a YouTube Live made a, um, left a recording there. So that's still shareable. Um, and I just want to echo a little bit really quickly what's being going on in the chat, uh, really uh, just echoing what Carolyn Moon said. 
Uh, I feel a little scared that there isn't a place for technicians slash designers slash stage managers in the digital fringe space. I know. Um, really agree with that. Uh, Elia and, um, sorry, um, Jennifer and Brad <laughs> and Kaylee. Um, there's this big question about hybridization. Like how does one do live and some type of digital production together? How do you work with artists to communicate that and, and make that work happen? Um, that's a big question. A anyone want to answer real quickly about this idea of hybridization? I think the hybridization is actually an invitation for m more potential work for, for designers if possible. If you've ever tried to get lighting to work for camera and in the room for, I mean, it's, it's another level of design that's required, not less. Um, uh, isn't there space for text designers SMs in the digital fringe space? I think so too. I think some of those roles have been transformed because of the bottleneck of the platforms. Whereas if the platforms expanded to be more suited for a hybrid model, so to speak, I think that would uh, come back and have a, a much more satisfying bandwidth and demand. Uh, Taylor? I think another thing that I've just kind of like been mulling about over the last little while is that um, I think at the moment, a lot of groups kind of have to decide if uh, they can pay a stage manager or they can pay someone to do video. And then either that person who's doing video or doing lighting design ends up becoming that stage manager for the event. So if anything, like we need more funding so that we can actually like hire everybody to do these things. Um, yeah. so I think funding is like the mm. true. That's, the, that's, that's a real for sure thing. Like when we did the array, having Kaylee in the room was pivotal pivotal we also had a lighting designer for all of those shows pivotal you know just whatever contribution i had behind the camera was, was i felt strong and valuable but it was so supplemented by other extremely talented uh sm and, and designer presences i will flag that there is a theater company i mean a, a tech company that is now hiring me specifically for logistics like all i do is show up and be logistics because um they just need that outside eye and it like it seems to really calm them when they have their own ability to focus on tech and cameras and switching and audio and then mm -hmm. to have me mm -hmm. like five minutes everyone like they're literally just hiring me for that mm -hmm. great totally and i think um i just want to make one last comment before we start wrapping things up um, I think as well, um, it's the advocacy to artists to recognize that just because there are these technologies that, um, you know, even though with the steep learning curve, you can learn and do that there is still the value of having a stage management, a technical director team, especially because I, I'm going to be honest, like the funding is, at least in the Canadian context, is very, um, very lenient right now. It's really up to the artists to be... Um, considering and not cutting roles because um, even if you go to digital production and film uh, those roles exist it's just a different job title and I think that's also part of that type of advocacy that probably needs to work um, um, I'm also just want to talk about um, just one really cool talk by Carolyn Moon about the BC Arts Council program um, uh, assistance pivot for individuals, very much so. Um, that's not only for artists, folks, that's for each one of you and the organizations and the artists you're connected to and yourself. So uh, really consider that. Um, anyway, uh, before we yeah. wrap it up, any last remarks, Em, anyone? Uh, no, um, I was gonna tell you guys that I noticed that many people have more questions. We didn't get to do the breakout, which because we do very much value Chase and Taylor, we understand, but if you have questions that you wanted to use in that space, we do apologize. However, there, um, we are gonna send a follow-up feedback survey in a couple of days. That's a good opportunity to give feedback if you have any further questions. I'm not going to give you Taylor or Chase's personal email to follow up with them. What they share with you is their prerogative, but again, 400 emails in one day, no thank you. We've all been there, no thank you. 
And so um, the GVPTA does continue to look at how we can further these conversations. So again, if you have any specific topics you want to address, the feedback survey is an amazing place to do that. And also, thank you guys for coming. I didn't think people would come. I was very nervous, as you can tell. I'm not used to being on screen. I was so much a little more comfortable when I was backstage and Taylor was talking and I was like, okay guys, so we have five minutes left and to move on, we will talk about this. So, um, it's very nice just to be back with my community and I won't cry on screen, but I will assure you it's very heartwarming. Thank you guys. Yes, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Chase. Uh, and thank you everyone that has shown up. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, um, yeah, uh, keep, keep on going. And honestly, I think, oh, irrevocably this time in our lives is changing the way we're going to be doing things even after a vaccine or what have you. So um, thank you so much for contributing that. Taylor, Chase, any last uh, words? Uh, we'll get through this. <laughs> yeah, that too. We will get through this. We will get to have theater with people again. Um, yeah, I, I mean, thanks for coming and, you know, listening to us kind of ramble and chat about a digital festival we did in two months. <laughs> well as some of our side experiences that have come since then and doing a lot more digital work than we thought and you know uh, it's a it's a different and exciting time and if anybody was curious I'm drinking King Jasmine tea love it <laughs> y'all if you ever need tea recommendations this this lady knows her stuff I'm not lying <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're so good. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yes, um, all coffees with every single one of you. Thanks, Ingrid. Yes, um, this is our community. Let's continue chatting in different ways and connecting. So uh, you can contact um, if Taylor Chase um, if you're okay with it. Well, I'll uh, just send uh, me email davy at gvpta.ca. Again, that's davy at gvpta.ca. If there's any requests to connect with people as well. Okay. I put it in the chat. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> All right. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy out there. Bye. Bye.